Now, are you ready? Are you in Acts chapter 13? Well, we last left the Apostle Paul. He's on his first missionary journey and seen. Go ahead, Chris, if you would. There it is. There's the Mediterranean Sea, Paul's first missionary journey. Notice on the right-hand side of the slide, you'll see Syria, modern-day Syria. Go up to Seleucia. That's where Paul took off from. He's from Antioch. You'll see just above Seleucia. Antioch was a pretty important city. It was a Roman center of culture and government. And as we said last week, um, uh, professional musicians. And you know the culture is going to be in trouble about that one. So there was gambling, there was prostitution. I think to myself, man, that sounds a lot like Washoe and Story County. I, I don't know. But there's Antioch. So go ahead and hit our go button, Chris. Here's what he's going to do. He's going to take off. We saw last week from Seleucia. He's going to head down to an island called Cyprus. That's where Barnabas is from. Here are the uh, balances of our chapter. They're going to hop across the Mediterranean. They're going to join uh, in Perga. And then you'll see a second Antioch at the top. Go ahead and leave that up, Chris, as we take off. Are you ready? Chapter 13, verse 1. Now, when Paul and his party, you might want to circle that, how'd they get started? Who was the leader when they first got rolling? It was Barnabas. Rightfully so, because Barnabas was a little ahead in the faith than Paul was. Remember when Paul first got saved, how much head knowledge did he have? Truckloads. But how was his grace? Wherever Paul went in those first few weeks of his salvation, there was a riot. He goes away for 13 years. He comes back and comes under the authority and the covering, really, of Barnabas. But now remember what happened last week. Paul went head to head demonstrating the spiritual gift of discernment of spirits and knew that this guy they were up against, he was probably demonized. And then he pronounces using another set of spiritual gifts, gift of knowledge, because God dropped in his heart, I'm going to bring this guy to blindness. His blindness is inwardly, but I'm going to give him a blindness that everyone will see that he doesn't know what he's talking about. And then Paul, exercising another gift, faith, then said, you're going to be blind, and that's what happened. It would seem that uh, after that, Barnabas is all, you know what I'm discerning? He's remembering Psalm, if you want to write here in your margin, Psalm 75, verse 7. Exaltation, or raising up, comes neither from the east nor from the west or from LinkedIn.com. It doesn't come from there. It comes from God. He is the judge. He puts down one and exalts another. This could have been a struggle for authority. Paul could have said, I'm really, you know, doing the stuff here. And Barnabas, you know, you're kind of wired a little differently. Let me take the lead. My hunch is that Barnabas, who is wise in the Lord, fruit over time. I think he's recognizing and he's thinking, Paul, I think... This is not my show here. This is the Lord's. And I think you're the one supposed to be leading it. It's subtle, but please notice. I also want you to notice that not everyone is able to prefer God's word over their relationships. We learned last week that John Mark, the guy who will eventually write the gospel of Mark, and they're going to travel extensively with Peter a little bit later on. John Mark is Barnabas's nephew. Is it possible that when Paul then comes to the forefront and Barnabas, Barnabas really does back up a little bit, guess who doesn't like it? And John, Mark, Barney's nephew, departing from them, returned to Jerusalem. It happens, Harvest, it surely does. Much of successful ministry is just keep showing Papa Sal. Just keep showing up. I'm telling you, devotions, um, trying to read God's word, praying in a consistent way. It always starts out with a kind of a wee, and then the novelty wears off, and then it's, oh. And then the enemy's right there. Be surprised what starts happening, what you have to do during that time that you've dedicated to the Lord. Harvest, huge component of God's success is just don't give up. 
When we bail out, like John Mark does here, not trusting God's covering, we don't know, did he prefer Uncle Barney because he's the son of consolation? He's a throw an arm around a shoulder type guy. Is Paul? I don't think so. <laughs> I don't like it. When we bail and not trust God's covering, how much then did I not learn? Because I'm out of there. How much of God's growth did I not experience because I'm gone. How many testimonies do I not now have that might have encouraged somebody else because I got my feelings hurt? Interesting. Verse 14. But when they departed from Perga, you can see it on the map, they came to Antioch of Pisidia. Notice it's not the same one. And went into the synagogue on the Sabbath day and they sat down. You might want to write in your margin here, Romans 1, verse 16. Paul will say later, I am not ashamed of the gospel, for it is the power of God for salvation for everyone who believes, comma, for the Jew first and also to the Greek. What do you mean the Jews first? Paul knew, now he knew his primary ministry was going to be for the Gentiles, but he also knew that if a Jewish person ever did get saved, how much Bible do the, does the typical synagogue-going Jew absorb? Quite a bit. Jews had the Old Testament prophecies and types and stories and models, all pointing to the coming Messiah. And when the light bulb goes on for one of them, a converted Jew made radical Christians and great Bible teachers. Verse 15. And after the reading of the law and the prophets, <clears throat> the rulers of the synagogue sent to them saying, men and brethren, if you have any word of exhortation for the people, say on. Hey, Paul, you got anything to say? After they were reading their Bible, <laughs> I wrote my margin. Imagine um, saying that to a freshly saved Paul. Remember the Damascus model, a 2.0 of Paul? How did that work out? He had to be led over a wall in a basket. But after 13 years in the desert, and now years under Barnabas, let's watch and see what he does. Verse 16. He clears his throat. Why, thank you. I have a thought or two. Verse 16. Then Paul stood up and motioned with his hand and said, Men of Israel, a lot of Jews here in this city, and you who fear God. If you weren't a Jewish person, if you were really seeking God, often God would lead you to a synagogue because that's where the Bible was being preached. So there's Gentiles here too. Verse 17. The God of this people Israel chose our fathers and exalted the people when they dwelt as strangers in the land of Egypt. And, when, and with an uplifted arm, he brought them out of it. And I wrote my margin, wait a minute. <laughs> if we keep reading, you are going to notice, ding, he's given them a history lesson of their own Jewish history. That sounds familiar. That's what Stephen did in Acts chapter 7. Who was listening the day when the old fogies were plugging their ears and leaping over tables? Shut up, shut up. And they threw their coats down at whose feet? Saul. Saul heard Stephen. I think he not only heard Stephen go through the history, point out that the Jewish honchos were the first ones to miss God's plain revelation of Jesus Christ. I think that not only shook him up, but I think Paul will never, ever forget as the stones are pinging off of his skull, he is collapsing under large hematomas, breath leaving his body, he still looked up to heaven and had the face of an angel. Paul, I think, that I don't think Paul ever forgot that. I don't think he did. It's one thing to uh, know God's word, but it's another thing to know God's word with grace. And I couldn't help but think, let's zoom back in our mind's eye. There's Stephen almost breathing his last. If his eyes weren't swollen closed because of the blows, 
I wonder if he looked around all of that crowd and saw the angry faces and winding up with more stones. And in my sort of Spielberg-esque mind, I see Stephen's last closing visuals, a young man holding coats. If it went down that way, is it possible that Stephen could have thought, well, I guess my ministry is not amounting to much, and here I go. Could have. But please remember this verse. It's really important. It's Isaiah 55, verse 11. Isaiah 55, verse 11. So shall my word be that goes forth from my mouth, my Bible. It shall never return to me void, but it shall accomplish what I please, and it shall prosper to the thing for which I sent it. Let me rephrase. Whenever we're living God's word or speaking God's word, what you see through camera one and camera two might be, ew, yuck, shut up. But please remember this story in Acts chapter 13. What is Paul doing? He is remembering the sermon of Stephen. Harvest here it is, and please don't ever forget this. It's right here. Keep living and saying God's word. Amen? Today it may look like nothing's happening. But notice here, was Paul affected? He was. Verse 18. Mm. Isaiah 55, verse 11, playing out right here in front of us. Verse 18. Now from a time of about 40 years, he, God, put up with their, Israel's way there in the wilderness. They were rebellious, remember. Verse 19, and when he had destroyed seven nations in the land of Canaan, or the promised land, he, God, then distributed their land, their land to them by allotment. And after he gave them judges for about 450 years until Samuel the prophet. And afterward, they asked for a king. Now, did God want them to have a human king? Nope. He said, I'll tell you what. Let me be your leader because I know the future. I know what all of the terrible enemies around you, what they're planning, even in their beds. Let me run the show. And what did the humans do? No. <laughs> you want a king like the other nations. I could see the Lord in the, in the voice of... of, of uh, <laughs> How's that working for you to some of these other nations? Oh, my. Isn't that funny? We don't want you, God. We want another human. So God gave them Saul. This would be King Saul, the son of Kish, a man of the tribe of Benjamin for 40 years. God gave Israel exactly what they wanted, handsome. Remember, he was tall. He was head and shoulders above everybody else. They wanted a giant of a man. And did they have any indication that God could say, you know, there's bigger giants out there. You sure you want this guy? Yes, he looks the best on television. Samuel had a face for radio. We don't like that guy as much. We want this guy, a giant of a man. And God says, watch this. And you know the story. Soon God brings whom? Goliath. You think your giant's all that in a bag of chips? Let me show you a giant. Roar! Ten feet tall. The spear was like a weaver's beam. The metal a spear point weighed ten pounds. Put a bowling ball on the end of a oof and then throw it. And that's how huge he was. Where is the God of Israel? Camera zooms to Israel's giant. What's Saul doing in the tent? <laughs> you know the story, David shows up. You remember that, you guys? He's saying to the synagogue there, remember that? And then verse 20, and after, he gave them judges for about 450 years, and then Samuel the prophet, verse 21, and after they asked for a king, rebellious again. So God gave them Saul, verse 22. And when he, God, removed him, Saul, he raised up for them David as king, to whom also he gave testimony. And he said, I have found David to be the son, the son of Jesse, a man after my own heart, who will do my will. See, that's the thing about humans. We love and prefer talent over character. I'm the same way. How many of you love, what is it, Tuesday nights, America's Got Talent? The guy spins 55 plates and juggles a chainsaw, a BB, and a birthday cake. 
we're like, whoa, that's awesome. I'll watch that all day long. We love talent. We'll pay top dollar to see it. But please notice God is never enamored by what's on the surface. God is always about what? The heart. What is character? Character is what you do and who you are when nobody's looking. What's King David doing in his off times? He's the youngest of several brothers, and so he got the worst job in the whole farm. Watch the sheep all night. He got the night shift. He's 12, 13 years old. What does he do? He grumps and he goes, I got the lousy end of the stick. I'm talented. What did he do? He got his guitar out and he played and wrote worship songs. What do we do with our downtime or what's perceived downtime? God isn't using me right now. What am I going to do? I think I'll frump. Or like a King David I'm going to use this time and I'm going to worship my king, character. David has a truckload of character. Saul did not. And of course, you know the story. He blows up. He practically blows up Israel. Verse 23. And from this man, David's seed, according to the promise, hundreds of prophecies in the Old Testament, God raised up for Israel a savior, Jesus. Verse 24. Jesus, after John the Baptist, which these guys probably knew about, they knew John the Baptist, had first preached before his, Jesus' coming, the baptism of repentance to all the people of Israel. And as John the Baptist was finishing his course, he said, who do you think that I am? I am not he, meaning Messiah. Notice your italicized word is in the is in capital. That's the translators letting you know this is referring to Messiah. I'm not the Messiah, but behold, there comes one after me, the sandals of whose feet I am not worthy to loose. When John the Baptist showed up, many thought, are you the Messiah? What was his response? No, no, I'm not him. I'm the Isaiah chapter 40 verse 3 guy. I'm the voice of one crying in the wilderness. There's Messiah. Why does Paul go here? My hunch is he believes that that was so huge. What is this now? Probably 15-ish years from when John the Baptist did this. I think that because all of Israel turned out to see John the Baptist there at Beth Barah, I believe he thinks there may be some of them in the crowd. You remember John the Baptist and all the baptism and everybody was excited? Yeah, whatever happened to that guy? Remember what he did. Behold, there's the Lamb of God who takes away the sin of the world. I think there's some of those in this crowd. Anyway, verse 26. Men and brethren, son of the family of Abraham, Jewish guys, and those among you who fear God, non-Jews seeking God, they're in the synagogue, so they're Gentiles. To you the word of this salvation has been sent for those who dwell in Jerusalem and their rulers, because they did not know him, the Messiah, Jesus, nor even the voices of the prophets, they didn't listen to all the fulfilled prophecy that Jesus did, which are read every Sabbath, they sat in synagogues just like this, and they missed it, have fulfilled them when they condemned Jesus. God knows the future. More about that in just a minute. God knows the future. And he knew that these knuckleheads were going to be all puffing their intellectual chests out. All the while, they're going to miss the fulfillment of hundreds of prophecies standing right in front of them, even when he raises from the dead. Check it out, verse 28. And though they found no cause for death in him, they asked Pilate and he, Jesus, that he, Jesus, should be put to death. Now when they had fulfilled all that was written concerning him, Jesus, they took him down from the tree and laid him in a tomb. Yeah, we heard about that. Verse 30. But God raised him from the dead, and he, Jesus, was seen for many days by those who came up with him from the Galilee to Jerusalem, who are witnesses to the people. Don't take my word for it. You heard about the resurrection, and some of you know someone who was an eyewitness of it. 
I personally believe if we have a video, he'd be looking at a couple guys. I know who you guys are. I saw you there at Bathbara. I don't know that to be true. I wonder. But anyway, all, if you don't believe me, ask the guys who saw him. And Harvest, by the way, if you think about it, every other religion that's available for consumption or faith, you're going to have to take the founder's word for it. Uh, Buddha, um, Muhammad, Joseph Smith Jr., whatever, you're going to have to take their word for it that they have some spectacular note information that you don't. All right. How about receive Jesus Christ who claimed that he was God who zipped up a human suit. Buddha never claimed to be the creator of the heavens and the earth. Jesus did. Muhammad never claimed that he was the star maker. Jesus did. And he said, I know you're looking at me funny, but watch this. To show you that I am who I am, I'm going to let them kill me brutally and violently. And you'll all will see it on the most Heinous death machine known to man, the cross. And for a minute, it's going to look weird until three days, you're going to see me at Starbucks. <laughs> you're going to see me at Walmart. You're going to see me at Costco. What if you did? I remember that guy. They ripped the flesh off of his back. Stripped off all of his clothes. And a Roman soldier shoved a spear into his side. Blood and water came out. We know what that means. Dead, to dead, to dead, to dead, to dead, to dead, to dead. Dead. And now I see him at Walmart. What's up, Steve? What would that be like if that was your experience? Paul is saying, I've seen the resurrected Jesus and I know guys who have seen him too. And if it really happened, what say you? Verse 32. And we declare to you glad tidings, good news, if you will, the gospel. That promise which was made to the fathers, all those Old Testament Messiah prophecies, God has fulfilled for us their children. And he, God, raised up Jesus, as it is also written in the second psalm. Quote, you are my son. Today I have begotten you. That's Psalm 2, verse 7. And FYI, by the way, there are many people who don't believe that Jesus is God, that the Bible claims that Jesus has always existed. And they say, uh-uh. So, so look at this, right here, Psalm 2. And this day I have begotten you. Ha! See, Jesus had a genetic beginning, which means he can't be eternal. Please notice what Paul is doing here. He is saying that you were born to me, or this day I've begotten you, was not his birthday, but the day he, what? Resurrected. So if you ever get that, um, maybe if you get a chance sometime today, go back to Tom 2. Psalm 2, verse 7, and scratch in your margin, Acts 13, verse 33. See, Jesus is not eternal because he had a birthday. No, Paul says that, that uh, the psalmist was speaking of his resurrection day. Verse 34, and that he, God, raised him, Jesus, from the dead, no more to return to corruption. He, God, has thus spoken, I will give you the sure mercies of King David. He's citing Isaiah 55, 3, verse 35. Therefore he, God, also says in another psalm, quote, you will not allow your Holy One to see corruption. That's Psalm 16, verse 10, verse 36. For David, after he had served his own generation by the will of God, he fell asleep or he died. He was buried with his fathers and he did sort of kind of like Mozart. I say this every time. Like Mozart, David is decomposing. <laughs> Sorry about that. He did see corruption, meaning so it wasn't talking about him. It was talking about Messiah. Verse 37. But he whom God raised up saw no corruption. Jesus didn't rot in the grave. He raised from the grave. Verse 38, 
Therefore, let it be known to you, brethren, that through this man, Jesus, is preached to you the forgiveness of sin. Verse 39. By him, everyone who believes is justified all things from which you could not be justified by the law. You couldn't do enough do's and don'ts because we've all broken the law. That doesn't save you. And here in the synagogue, people are telling you that they can. The law cannot save because it's not a ladder to achieve the righteousness of God. You've got to be saved by grace. That's what he's saying. Verse 40. So beware, therefore, you in the synagogue listening to me, lest what has been spoken in the prophets come upon you. What's he referring to? God knew that the religious Jews would say, Pshaw, Pshaw, and they are in hell because of it. Don't be like them. Verse 41. Behold, your, you despisers marvel and perish. This is, he's now citing Habakkuk chapter 1, verse 5. Behold, you despisers marvel and perish. For I will work a work in your day, whew, a work which you will not, by no means believe, though one were to declare it to you. That's Habakkuk chapter 1, verse 5. Remember that verse, you um, synagogue people? Well, here it is. Jesus, the Messiah, the resurrected one, eyewitnesses still walking around, is him. And you in the synagogue, don't be like them. Don't miss it. Verse 42. So when the Jews went out of the synagogue and the Gentiles begged that these words might be preached to them the next Sabbath. Come back again, you guys. That's what the Gentiles are saving, saying. What do you suppose the Jews are saying? Verse 43. Now when the congregation had broken up, many of the Jews and devout proselytes followed Paul and Barnabas, who, speaking to them, persuaded them to continue in the grace of God. Allah's not going to save you. You need the one who fulfilled those, Jesus Christ. Verse 44. Now on the next Sabbath, almost what? The whole city came together to hear the word of God. But when the Jews saw the multitudes, they were filled with joy because people were getting saved. What were they filled with? Envy. By the way, the works of the flesh, the fruit of the flesh, is envy in that lineup. It sure is. You see, that's what religion does. You don't believe like me? I'm going to cancel you because I live in a cancel culture. Canceled, Paul. And the contradicted and blaspheming, they opposed the things spoken of by Paul. Verse 46. Then Paul and Barnabas grew bold and said, it was necessary that the word of God should be spoken to you Jews first. So I did that. But since you rejected it and judge yourselves unworthy of everlasting life, you really do want to go to hell. All right. Well, behold, we're going to turn to the Gentiles then. Verse 47. For so the Lord has commanded us. Now he's going to speak a line out of Isaiah 49. I, the Lord, have set you, Messiah, as a light to the Gentiles, that you should be for salvation to the ends of the earth. All right, you Jews, you are literally fulfilling Isaiah 49. So then are we. We are going to take this glorious message that God zipped up a human suit, never broke any of the law, and then paid for all sin. And salvation then is received by simply receiving the free gift he already gave. So we're going to take this to the Gentiles, verse 48. Now when the Gentiles heard this, they were glad and glorified the word of the Lord. And as many as had been appointed to eternal life, believed. Okay, everybody, take a deep breath. What? What? Did you know, uh, if you've been in the church for very long, and if you've done any serious study of the Bible, you're going to run into, let me show you something. Hold your finger here. Would you join me in the book of Ephesians? Book of Ephesians, Galatians, Ephesians, chapter 1. Well, really, the whole book of Gal or, uh, Ephesians, for that matter. But let's go to Ephesians, chapter 1, real quickly. Chapter 1, Ephesians, verse 1. Paul, an apostle of Jesus Christ, by the will of God, okay, yada, 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 verse 3. 
don't, don't say that I said the word of God is yada yada. Okay, don't, don't say that, Mike. Don't, don't tell anybody I said that. Verse three, please, interest of time. Blessed be the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, who has blessed us with every spiritual blessing in heavenly places in Christ, period. What do you got there? Comma. He's not done. What? Who has blessed us with every, everybody say, every spiritual blessings in heavenly places, comma, just like or just as he, Jesus, chose us Christians in him. Now watch this. You mean when you bowed your head and received the Lord Jesus? No, look at this. Before the foundation of the world. Uh, what? I personally believe that God's word says that life and godliness, everything you need for life and godliness is here in the Bible. I know I'm supposed to say that. I'm the pastor. If you have a scientific background, you've probably run into some thoughts and ideas that say you can't possibly believe that Bible, can you? It's fairy tale. If you don't know sort of the the uh, march of knowledge and how we've attained what we've attained, then this is a real head scratcher. When did you get saved? When I asked the Lord into my life. Yes. However, you know when God wrote your name in the Lamb's book of life? Before the what? Before he made one molecule, he knows who did receive him in 1930 in 1980, in the year 2063, he knows who is going to receive him, and he also knows who doesn't. Those of their own free will, because that's what the Bible says, for God so loved the world, he gave his only begotten son, that whosoever will, it's your own choice, believe in him shall have everlasting life. Some people get so weird on this, they say, well, you know, if you are predestined or predestinated, that means, God, you're chosen, but your roommate is not. So sad for Sam. You mean he's not going to go to hell? You're not going to go to heaven? Nope. He's not predestined. He's not chosen. And some churches who believe this in such a way, they'll, they will never give a, um, a gospel message and they'll never give an altar call. Because if you're saved, you're saved. If you're not, well, too bad. So sad for you. What is going on here? Doesn't the Bible say that God wishes that none should perish? Well, who does God want saved? Everyone. Well, what does he do to help them get saved? Whatever is needed and necessary. Paul, I believe. Now, next week, we're going to see chapter 14. Lord willing, and we're going to see Paul take, taken out of a city called Lystra, and they stone him to death. And Dr. Luke, who wrote the book of Acts, he put his stethoscope to, uh, so to speak, to Paul's lifeless body and said, he's gone. They prayed, and suddenly Paul, what, sits up, dusts off the dust, and writes a strongly worded complaint to his missionary board. What does he do, you guys? He gets back up and he, say it with me, he goes back in. I thought we killed you. Many, many years later, Paul would say, I know a guy. Now, I don't know if it was in the flesh or in the spirit. I don't know. He's talking about himself. I know a guy who was dead once and he saw heaven. Okay? I personally believe, hold your finger, actually, you're in, uh, you're in Ephesians, right? Um, skip over to chapter three. I want to show you something that may, you scientifically minded, you engineers in the crowd, you might get a kick out of this. In the whole book of Ephesians, by the way, if you do a, a detailed study, wow, the insights. It's almost like Paul had a camcorder and went to heaven and see how things work. Remember, it's Ephesians that says, you know what? We don't wrestle against flesh and blood. It's not your spouse. Who are we really fighting? Principalities and powers, demons. Really? How does he know that? How did he know that I was predestined before the foundation of the world? 
Chapter 3, verse 18, please. Man, with all knowledge of wisdom, verse 18, that you, Ephesian Christians, may be able to comprehend with all the saints what is the width, length, depth, and... Whoa, whoa, Paul, dude, there's only three dimensions, height, width, and depth. Why does Paul mention a fourth dimension? My personal opinion, because he saw it. All right, are you ready? Larry, you're gonna get a kick out of this. Are you ready? Check this out, let's go to our first slide. What is this? Glad you asked. That is the National Institute of Standards and Technology. You get a ruler, you get a weight of some kind. How do you know it's accurate? The OGs, the original, the actual, what everything else is compared to any sort of measurement device lives here in the National Institutes of Standard and Technology, the NIST complex in Boulder, Colorado. Uh, if you're curious, it's uh, elevation 5,318 feet above sea level. Um, let's go to another one. This is the Royal Observatory, Observatory in Greenwich, England. Greenwich may ring a bell. It's where the longitude zero line runs through. Latitudes go this way, longitudes go this way around the planet. Where does it begin? Where Green Greenwich Mean Time is zero for everybody's clock, if you didn't know that. Well, they have something that looks like this. Go ahead. What is that? That's our new coffee machine we have in the youth room. <laughs> Boy, that's going to make you an espresso like you've never had before. No, what that is, is that's the, that is the NIST F2 cesium fountain atomic clock. Isn't that good stuff right there? I love saying that. How does it work? I don't have time to tell you how it works. It works really well. Here's the point. It is so accurate. It only loses a whole second every 300 million years. The NIST building has one of these in their building at 5,318 feet. Go back up one slide, if you would, Chris. The London Observatory, you know what their altitude is? They are a whopping 154 feet above sea level. Okay? Go down one slide. There's a cesium clock. Now, on your phone, on your computer, Whenever you have a sort of a, a device that tells you what actual time is, time is, Greenwich Mean Time, do you know where you get those measurements from? Clocks like these in Colorado that are then connected to the system and gives us what time of day it is. That's a F2 cesium fountain atomic clock, and it's so accurate it only loses one second every 300 million years. The London Observatory has one too. At the end of the day, they only lose one second every 300 million years. But at the end of a 24-hour period, did you know that this one in Colorado at 5,300 feet above sea level is different than the one at 154 foot level? They're different clocks, or I should say they're running different time. Very small, measured in nanoseconds, but they're very, very small, different. But they're different. Well, which one is right? 5,300 feet above sea level or 154 feet above sea level? Which one is correct? Larry, both of them. How many of you are like, cramp in my medulla oblongata? <laughs> well, which one is right? The answer is both. Hit the go button. They figured out, did you know what? And they got a formula for it. Did you know that atomic clocks are faster by 10 to the negative 16 nanoseconds per meter of elevation? Uh, I didn't know that either. The further away you go from the core of a planet, your clock will slow down. Are you sure? Let's go to our next one. Everybody aboard? Let's get on Pan Am. This is October of 1971. That gentleman there is Mr. Joseph C. Haffel. He's a physicist there at Washington University in St. Louis. 
he knew about Mr. Einstein's theory of general relativity. What you see there, he bought two other, well, three tickets really for himself and two more for three tall, two across. Those are uh, atomic clocks that you could put on an airplane. So he did. Let me read you the article. October 1971, the Hafel Keating experiment. Joseph Hafel, a physicist, and Richard E. Keating, an astronomer from the Naval Observatory there in Washington, D.C., they took six cesium beam atomic clocks aboard commercial airliners. They flew twice around the world, first eastward, then westward, and compared the clocks against the others that had remained at the United States Naval Observatory. The planes, with the, fl the planes flying with the Earth's rotation were 39 nanosecond different from the atomic clock that didn't move. And planes flying against the Earth's rotation lost 230 nanoseconds, 1971. What this is, is uh, this physicist, he knew this guy. Go ahead. Your favorite, favorite uncle, Mr. Albert Einstein. In 1905, Albert Einstein, um, he postulated, what a brain he had. He said, you know what I think? Well, I'll try to consolidate it. He says, I think this, go ahead. I think that energy is equal to the mass times the acceleration of the constant of the speed of light squared. E equals mc squared. And you know what most of the physics world said? Dude, you're drinking your bath water. You're nuts. He's basically saying, among other things, that time, linear time to us, past, present, future, we know what we've seen, we're currently viewing what's in front of us, but we can't see what's to come. Linear time can be messed with, time. And if you go fast enough, it all depends on velocity and mass, you go fast enough um, a ruler comes flying by my, my uh, notice at uh, 100 miles an hour. But I have a really good shutter speed on my camera. Click. It's only 12 inches long. It comes by me at 300 miles per hour. Good camera click. It's still 12 inches long, but it's a little bit longer. You speed that ruler up to the speed of light and it stops in front of you, your ruler is so long, it is actually infinite. At the speed of light, all matter becomes infinite. Anybody need a Gatorade? You guys all right? Yeah. And the theory is, if you travel to, at the speed of light to a planet, it takes you two years to get there, speed of light, two years back, so you've been gone four years, your twin brother who didn't go, he aged four years, but how many, age, how many, how many years did you age? Not a thing, because you were traveling at the speed of light. It's all weird, it's wacky, I get it. Let me sort of kind of boil it all down to you. Time is affected by, by momentum and gravity, and it was predicted by Einstein's general theory of relativity. Now follow me. Which means that time itself is connected to the creation. Does that make sense? Um, uh, light and uh, matter and humans, we are stuck on a linear time experience. It's linear. It never stops marching. There's past, present, and future. Einstein postulated that in another dimensional system, there is no linear time. I'll try to let that one sink in a minute. What are you talking about? Where God lives is that multidimensional system. Is God beyond three-dimensional times? Where we're right here. Three-dimensional heights within depth. Yes. Einstein said, I don't think there's three dimensions. I think there's four. Height, width, depth, and space-time. Hawking came along later, and he actually came up with something called the Schwarzschild Constant. And he says that in a black hole, time itself will begin to slow down and even curl back on each other, on itself, and can run theoretically backwards. <laughs> Don't worry, there won't be a test on all this. 
Here's what I'm trying to get you to see with, the, with Mr. EMC squared. Here's what I'm trying to get you to see. Einstein proved on a blackboard in 1905 that time itself, linear, is not linear like we thought. Time itself is a function connected to the molecules that God made. What? 1905 was his paper, and a few years later, he got a Nobel Prize for it. At first, they're all going, you're nuts. You're crazy. And then people started to squeak a squeak on the whiteboard, and they went, oh. And they gave him a uh, Nobel Prize for it, so now this is Mr. Einstein. Yeah, neener, 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 I told you. I told you. Get, yeah, get that off the screen. <laughs> In heaven, God doesn't have a lot of time on his hands. In heaven, there is no linear time. That's why he lives in eternity, and so did Jesus, and so does Jesus. God could, if you will, see the result of every timeline. So let's think multidimensionally. I'm going to make a planet, and so he does. And I'm going to set physics and chemistry in motion, and he does. And all these things play out, and it does. But that's linear time. Remember, he's outside of time. So where he lives, he can get off the timeline, go back to the very beginning before he actually started a timeline, and can see every single second of that timeline before there was a timeline. Is everybody okay? Why are we going all the way over there? Harvest a couple things. Um... When you're praying and somebody in a room in a circle is praying, have you ever thought, well, he's listening to my prayer. How is he going to get his prayer and his prayer and his prayer? Oh, and by the way, how does he know how to answer my prayer in, a, in the appropriate manner? Here's how. Because he can get off of the timeline, so to speak, like, much like you would view a parade from a helicopter. You see the beginning and you see the end. In his helicopter, he can get out of the parade and he can visit any portion of the timeline. Here's Adam and here's whenever time runs out. And he can get out in his helicopter and drop in time. That's why you see a pre-incarnate appearance of Jesus Christ in several places in your Old Testament. What? Yeah, before he was born, now he's talking to Joshua? Poof, you know, your head blows off. If you think multidimensionally, God is outside of the timeline. He can literally pick up and visit any timeline he wants. So he's going to drop into Tuesday night prayer right here in our sanctuary. And there I am praying. And then there's Kinsey praying. And then there's Sherry praying. And there's Diana praying and Dee, Dee praying. And here we are praying. Well, who, which, which one can he listen to? What's the answer multidimensionally? How long can he just say, I'm going to freeze relative to the humans. It's freeze frame. But I'm just dropping in here from my non-linear time eternity. And I'm going to camp on this one prayer request that Steve had. Hmm. Steve asked if he could, Lord, please, I would love the, the big pack of ho-hos, you know. And he's going, yeah, you know, I don't know, Steve. You know, you're kind of getting bigger and bigger. I don't think so. God has, and here's my summation thought, thesis principle. God has eternity. Future and past to consider one of your prayers. How it's going to affect the timeline. The history is leading up to it. And then when he's ready, he brings an answer from his eternal place and he settles it on the timeline that we can taste, touch, smell, and so on. Harvest, when we pray to him, that's why it's so important to pray his word. Because when we do, we are praying his heart. Back to this. Paul saw it. Are you in, uh, one more time, Ephesians chapter 3. May you guys be able to comprehend with all the saints what is the width, the length, the depth, and height. Is this the Apostle Paul saying, I saw some stuff when I was in heaven. And one of them is that I saw that God, from the beginning of the world, before the foundation of the world, before the timeline, he knew who was going to get saved. Back to predestinated. I'm running so out of time. You can pull your finger out of Acts 
I want you to join me in the book of Romans, and we'll end here. And now that we have a kind of the, the proper physics training, maybe this may make some more sense. Quickly, please, Romans chapter 8, look at verse 28. Book of Romans, chapter 8, verse 28. Paul, remember, he's the one who's going to die. He's going to go see heaven, and he saw some stuff. One of the things he told us in the book of Ephesians, you're not wrestling against flesh and blood, but against demons. I saw it. Another thing, it's four-dimensional. Now watch this and hold on tight. Chapter 8, verse 28. Paul, and I know that how many things, you guys? All things work together for good to those who love God and to those who are the call according to his purpose. How does Paul know that? Because Paul saw it. Verse 29. For whom he, uh, God, foreknew, he also predestined. If you will, the timeline, linear timeline, runs its course. God visited, oh, let's call it 1980, and he sees Steve over a dishwasher and uttering that beautiful Billy Graham-type salvation prayer. It wasn't any of that. Over a dishwasher, suddenly I was painfully aware. If I were to die right now, I would go to hell. Where was all my college? I just knew. That's what the Bible says the Holy Spirit does. He convicts us of sin, what we shouldn't be doing. Righteousness, what we should. And that there's a judgment day. And the Holy Spirit in his grace poured out of my heart and a non-saved 19-year-old self-styled scholar who thought he knew everything was suddenly and painfully aware. If I were to slip into eternity right now, I would not be with him. Where did that come from? It's the Holy Spirit. Here was my prayer. Dear God, I don't want to go to hell. Amen. And he heard me. I felt something go all through me. I did. Not everybody does, but I did. Something go all through me. And I'm telling you, Harvest, I was never the same after that. Everything looked different. So on the timeline, 1980, that was whatever it was. I think it was in the fall months of 1990. Did Steve, of his own free will, accept Jesus Christ? Yes. And God gets up off the timeline, so to speak. He goes back to before the timeline got started, and he said, yep, Steve's gonna, he's gonna receive me. And so then, that's the day before the foundation of the world, says Ephesians 1, that I predestined him. So harvest is really not that hard. I made it hard, I know. But the idea of are you predestined or aren't you? Here's how you know. Ask Jesus Christ into your life, and you are predestined to be conformed to the image of his son, not because of my performance, but before the timeline, before God created one molecule in the creation of which time, linear time is a part, he said, Steve, you're gonna make it. I will conform you to the image of Jesus Christ. How many of you can say amen to that? That he might be the firstborn among many brethren. Whoever, moreover, we're not done yet, whom he predestined, he also what? Called. If you are a born-again believer, are you called? Yes. And whom he called, he also justified. Big word. Just as if you never sinned. I used it before. You get me on a video committing a crime, throwing a rock. I go to the judge, I say, I didn't do it. And then they play the video and they freeze frame me in mid Mr. Burns kind of, <laughs> there I am. Am I guilty? Can the judge forgive me? Justification is, I'm going to forgive you. Now replay the tape. No rock. Uh, just a flower. Bing. I don't know. Just as if you had never sinned. Harvest, when you're asking the Lord to forgive you your sin, that's not positionally because he already did that. God could say, what sin? In a sense. He says we confess our sin one to another. That's because of us. Your sin and your secrets are keeping you from me. Get rid of it. Confess it. But he who also called you been justified just as if you'd never done it. And whom he also justified, he also glorified. What is that? Timeline, let's take it out. 
Adam and Eve, beginning of creation. There we go. Blah, blah, blah. There's Steve who gets saved. There's the rapture. There's the seven-year tribulation. There's the thousand-year reign of Messiah. On the other side of that, there's the new Jerusalem and judgment day. And let's go, whoa, well, I don't know, a billion years after that. God looks at that and he says, Woo! Steve, you should see yourself worshiping. And we'll, what? Because today, let's all stand. Because today, would you join me in prayer? Can you, can you take a breath? Sorry for all the physics. Not really, I love physics. I think it's kind of cool. But hopefully, I've, I've done my very best to show you that what the humans perceive is not how God perceives your loving heavenly father knows exactly everything you're going to do. In fact, he says in Psalm 139, did you know that all your days are written in a book? And he knows them all, Psalm 139. Well, how does he know that? Because he let the timeline roll once. And then he can get up out of the timeline and go back to the beginning and before the foundation of the world saying, Steve, receive me. He's predestined. He is called he is gifted. When did you get your spiritual gifts? When you prayed in the chair and all those ladies laid hands on you and said, my shin, my knee, my shin, my knee, my shin. That's when I got my spiritual gifts. No, you were gifted when harvest from before the foundation of the world. Why is that important? Because we're the ones who are performance oriented. If I do good, God loves me more. If I do badly, he can get so disappointed in me, he's liable to take my gifts from me, and he should because I'm a creep. You're not thinking four-dimensionally. How much of your sin was on that cross? Say it with me. All of it. You did nothing to earn your salvation. Why would it even be possible to unearn it? You were called, you were saved from the beginning from before the beginning of the earth. That's why Jesus said, you didn't choose me, I chose you. He could do that because he can get out of the timeline. I saw when you gave your heart to me and before there was one molecule, I called you, I predestinated you, I gifted you. And oh, by the way, I can cheat. I can get in my multidimensional helicopter and go to the end. And there you are a billion years in the beautiful new Jerusalem reconstituted earth. Not one single sin ever allowed in God's creation ever again. And you should see yourself. Oh, your new body. All the light and life and family and purpose. Well, we're not there yet, Harvest. We're not there yet. So until that day, here we are. I went through that entire exercise with the goal to lift your head from whatever the enemy is trying to squish you with. Harvest, your battle is not against the other human. It's against a spiritual warfare that, ra that rages all around you. You better put on your spiritual armor. You better also know that you are called from before the foundation of the world. So get back up. Get back up. Get back up. And go back in to that ministry, to that marriage, to that thing that's been kicking your butt. You're not using the right tools. Get back up. Use the tools he gave you that he knew you would need. So he gave them to you. He knit them within you from your mother's womb. Everybody sit down and eyes closed. Are you saved? If you're not, please do so. Right now, relative to your understanding of time and space, it's your own free will. God knows if you will choose him or if you won't. I pray in Jesus' name that today you choose him. Jesus, I don't want to go to hell. Amen. In Jesus' name, and now everybody said, Amen. 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 Steve, you didn't get finished with Acts chapter 13. I know. Um, 
all of, all of us who have that thing. We'll get it next week. Hey, we'll see you on Tuesday, Harvest. We love you. God bless you.